I want to talk to you about some projects within this Origins and Evolution project um, that uh, are relevant to this meeting. So there's several other projects that that uh, are being covered within this um, within its, this initiative, but I'm going to focus on the ones that, that are particularly relevant today. Um, and what we want to tr try and do is um, see how we can use the museum's life sciences collections to investigate the response of organisms to climate change. And there are three main strands that we're going to uh, be developing. The first is to look at phenology, which is looking at the seasonal response of organisms to climate. Uh, then we want to look at morphometry, looking at how uh, the size and shapes of organisms might be influenced by climate. And then also look at their niches as well. So how the distributional ranges of organisms uh, are, reflect, are um, influenced by climate. And there are several groups we want to be looking at, uh, including freshwater insects, bees, beetles, butterflies, flowering plants, and birds' eggs. Whether we'll get through all of those, I don't know. But anyway, they're on the kind of on the list of things to do. So I'm going to deal with each one of those three topics now. So the first one is phenology. Um, and various things we want to look at include things like the dates of uh, flowering in, in plants, the emergence times of, of insects, uh, the dates that uh, birds lay their eggs, and uh, dates that pollinia are removed from, uh, these are like pollen packets in, in, uh, in orchids, for example, which are removed by bees when, they, when the bees visit the flowers. So all of these, the dates of these events are all influenced by climate. Now, one advantage that the, all, the, all these things have already been investigated, but nobody's really used museum collections to look at these topics. And one of the big advantages that the museum collections offer is that it gives us a much longer time perspective. Most of the data that we have are based on observational records, at most covering 30 to 40 years, because the museum collections go back 100, 200 years. So this means we, it can provide a baseline particularly before the onset of rapid climate change in the last 30 or 40 years. So we could compare these phenological responses in the past to what's happening in, in more recent times. Can't read it on here. Um, oh yeah, the other, th the other thing is that um, the museum includes species that are rare today, so for which there's very little phenological data available. But in the, in the past, they were much more abundant, so we can get data on them. And the other ones are, are insects or, or plants that are, are hard to record. So the sort of things I'm thinking of are some of these butterflies that just spend the whole time in the tree canopy. And so observers on the ground don't see them because we've got massive amounts of material in the collection, so we can get data on them as well. So what we want from the collections is the place and the date of the collection um, of, those, of those organisms. And then we can compare the, the dates of those phenological events against climate records for, for, partic for the partic you know, appropriate year. Now, we've already done a, a small pilot study just to see if this kind of idea might work on four species of British butterflies, which I've shown here. We've picked them for various reasons. I won't go into the reasons now. But it's the orange tip, the Duke of Burgundy, the grizzled skipper, and the Adonis blue. And I'm just going to show you some preliminary data that we've got. So this shows. Uh, on the x-axis, the mean my March to May air temperature for the years that we've got specimens in the collection. So this is going back to about 1890. For most years, up until around about the early 1970s, but into the 1990s in some cases. And that's plotted against the 10th percentile date of the specimen in each, in each year. So the 10th percentile is essentially is a, is a, I won't go into it how you might work it out, but if, effectively it's the earliest collection date uh, in a particular year of e each, one of those, uh, each one of those species in each year. And you can see there's a very good relationship between uh, the, the, uh, the, the mean spring temperature and the early collection date. And what this is showing is it's a significant negative correlation between the earliest collection date and also the median collection date and spring temperature. In addition, we've got a significant positive correlation between the length of the flight period, which is measured by the 10th percentile date and the 90th percentile date. That gives us the, the length of the flight period. 
uh, against spring or summer temperature, depending on what time of year the, the butterfly is on the wing. So effectively, this, show, this is showing that warmer springs uh, result in earlier flying dates and an extended flying season, whereas cool, wet springs delay the first flying dates. So these data are very much in line with what's been found in, in the observational data. So this gives us confidence that we can extract reliable phenological data from the museum collections. But there's also some other data that is slightly different, some results that are slightly different from uh, observational data. For example, the rates of advancement in the, in the earliest date per degree centigrade um, for the early emerging switches is higher in the museum data than in the observational records. And similarly, um, March temperature is the key month for determining the emergence dates of these butterflies based on the museum data. But in more modern data, it's February. So what we think is happening here is that uh, because of the advancement of springs, in the past, February was never warm enough, really, to trigger the emergence of the butterflies. But now, February is the key month. It's got a lot warmer. The, and the reason for the rates of advancement getting lower is because the butterflies are reaching the limit of their, of, of their advancement. It's impossible for them to emerge any earlier than sort of early February. The day lengths are too short and it's never going to be warm enough. So this is showing extra additional information about differences in rates of change. Okay, moving on to morphometry. A um, couple of things we want to do, for example, on the left, these, this is a showing stomatal density in leaves. So the stomata are these small openings in, in leaves. And uh, the density of these stomata on the leaves is regulated by temperature, by precipitation, and by carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so by looking at the um, stomatal density, we can see how those changes in those variables affect the stomatal density. And use that to calibrate fossil material and then reconstruct changes in those uh, variables in the past. Similarly, leaf morph morphology, the shape of the cells in leaves uh, is, is influenced by the, the, the extent the leaf's expanded. So you can tell from in a fossil, for example, how close to or how soon after leaf burst the fossil was formed. So again, we can use the, the uh, museum collections to calibrate that and then look at changes in leaf burst in, in the fossil record. And we work, Mark Spencer in particular is working on this with uh, colleagues in Utrecht University. So again, you can see how the collection date and place of collection all comes into, into uh, is, is significant here. Then um, we're interested in looking at testing this hypothesis about um, whether wing and body symmetry and size of insects is influenced by climate as well. So one thing we want to look at is, for example, uh, use digitized images of uh, British and European dragonflies and look at asymmetry in those specimens, uh, the size of those specimens. For example, in this uh, banded demoiselle, uh, look at the uh, changes in the extent of that dark wing marking and how that might be influenced by climate and how the, distribution of, uh, how the distribution of those characters is distributed through the, rain, the distributional range, geographic range of those, of those insects. So again, collection date, place of collection is, is significant. Finally, the niches. Um, so people like Brian Huntley, others, have hypothesized that temperature and precipitation is the primary variables driving the distribution of European flora and fauna. Um, now, to me, it seems that freshwater insects, it's hard for me to see how precipitation could be significant in driving freshwater insect distribution. Basically, they're going to exist if there's water there. Um, so we want to test that hypothesis by compiling locality data on European freshwater insects and also beetles. Some of these groups are fairly poorly known, so we can use the museum collection to supplement distributional records and then model the distributional ranges of these organisms against climatic and environmental variables in order to determine actually what the major variables are driving the distribution of these, of these groups. And so we'll be working in collaboration with colleagues at um, Queen's University in Belfast on that. So just a minute under. That's not bad. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>